the sun, that great life-giving thermal nuclear reactor in our sky. The star that dominates our little corner of the galaxy floods our solar system with more than just light. Every second, the sun blasts out about 600,000 metric tons of charged particles, mostly electrons, protons, and helium nuclei, in all directions. We call this steady flow of particles the solar wind. Now, moving charges create magnetism. So as those charged particles race through the solar system, they create something called the interplanetary magnetic field. That field interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, and its effects reach all the way to the ground. Not much. The interplanetary magnetic field only shifts the Earth's field by about one part in 10,000. But if you had a detector that was sensitive enough, you could monitor the solar wind from your own living room. And today, I'm going to show you how to do it. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Citizen Scientist Workshop. I'm Dr. Sean. To track the solar wind thousands of miles out into space, you're going to need to construct one of the most sensitive instruments known to science. Fortunately, that's a lot easier than it sounds. The instrument is called a torsion balance, and it works by suspending a sensor, in our case a small but very powerful magnet, from a fine filament so that it's free to track the direction of the local magnetic field. The direction that our sensor faces will shift with the direction of the field. By bouncing a laser beam off the sensor onto a distant wall or screen, we can easily track these shifts in real time. This technique can achieve astonishing sensitivities because, with a large enough distance between the sensor and the screen, even the tiniest deflections can be detected. What may be even more remarkable is how cheap this torsion balance magnetometer is to make. The sensor is nothing more than a couple of rare earth magnets stuck together across a glass cover slide of the type used for making microscope slides, superglued to a fine nylon filament taken from a soft nylon rope. Let's start with the housing. It's fashioned from a 2-inch ID T-socket that's made from PVC. To allow the laser beam to sweep through the widest possible range of angles, we're going to use a hacksaw to trim off the neck of the T and then mount the sensor off-center so that it sits like a flower box in a windowsill. Make sure to clean up the rough spots with a little sandpaper. Now, while it's not really necessary to paint the housing, I think the instrument looks a lot cooler if you do. So I masked off the outside and sprayed the interior with three light coats of bright racing yellow enamel paint. After that set, I masked off the inside and painted the outside with three light coats of fire engine red. Since this instrument is only going to see light duty, I didn't bother to prime the surface first. Now it's on to the sensor. While sizes vary, the cover slides I used were 22 by 22 millimeter squares. Unless you want fingerprints to smear out the laser spot, always wear latex gloves when handling them. It's important to keep the laser spot exactly on the sensor's axis of rotation, and the best way to do that is to blacken the glass except for a thin strip that runs right along the axis. That way, if the laser isn't correctly positioned, the spot will disappear. To do that, use a sharp pair of scissors to cut a very narrow strip of painter's tape with a length that's about twice the width of the cover slide. Carefully stretch the strip so that it's exactly centered diagonally across the cover slip as shown. Then use the free ends to secure the glass to a sheet of newsprint and give it a coat of flat black spray paint. When it's dry, carefully remove the tape and your reflector is now complete. Next, you'll need to secure the filament. From a spool of soft nylon cord, cut a short length of, say, 30 centimeters or about one foot. The cord is composed of bundles of extremely fine nylon fibers that are so thin they're actually quite difficult to see. First, untwist one end and isolate a single bundle. To make the individual filaments more visible, I use a bright flashlight to illuminate things from the side, as you see here. Then, separate out a single fiber using a pair of tweezers, or better, a pair of forceps or clamps like this. Next, clip small rubber-tipped utility clamps that you can purchase from almost any hardware store to each end of the filament. To properly position the filament on the reflector, you're going to need a raised base like this one. 
To make it, I stacked two rubber O-rings with a diameter that's roughly the same as that of the reflector. Gently stretch the filament across the base. Then place the reflector painted side down on the stack and position the clip so as to gently stretch the filament across the unpainted diagonal. Position things very carefully so that the filament runs precisely between the tips. Then, deposit a tiny dollop of cyanoacrylate bonding agent, often branded as crazy glue, on each corner, and quickly use a bit of paper towel to dab up the excess before it sets. Once both corners have set, it's time to install the magnets. Now, since we want the magnetic field from the solar wind to cause our sensor to rotate, we need the interaction between the sensor and the field to create a torque, or a rotating force. Since, as you may remember from high school physics, torque increases not only with the strength of the applied force, but also with the length of the lever arm, I decided to try out these two tiny cylindrical magnets from the K&J Magnetics Company. Each of these magnets, part number D14-N52, is one quarter inch long. So the two together, when clamped by their magnetic fields to the glass cover slide, are a little more than half an inch long. By replacing the shorter disc magnets with these, we can easily increase the strength of the torque that acts on the sensor by a factor of eight. And just for sake of completeness, here's what the magnetic field looks like around one of these tiny monsters. The field strength at the surface is over 7,300 gauss. That's about 14,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. To attach the magnets, place one inside the stack of O-rings under the reflector and slowly bring the other magnet down from the top. Carefully position the top magnet so that it is centered on the filament at the point that bisects the line between the opposite diagonals, which you should be able to judge well enough by eye. Your sensor is now complete. To install it into the housing, you're going to need to attach it to two cross beams that we're going to fashion out of toothpicks. Now, whenever you install a wooden part into a scientific instrument, it's usually a good practice to coat it first to protect it against humidity. And for small jobs like this one, nail polish can be a citizen scientist's best friend. I use two layers of clear coat on each of the toothpicks. Next, you're going to need to notch the top and bottom of the case to hold the toothpick crossbars. Use a straight edge to make a line that's parallel to the front face of the housing and that's set back about a centimeter or so from the front edge of the T. Use a Dremel tool to cut and shape the notches so that the toothpicks fit snugly in place. The fit needs to be snug so that the tiny crossbars won't slip during the next step when you're adjusting the tension in the fiber. When that's done, attach a toothpick to either end of the filament using a droplet of crazy glue and then drop the sensor into the housing. The sensor will tend to align to the Earth's magnetic field, so position the housing so that the painted side of the sensor is facing outward. Roll up the filament so that the center is about half a centimeter or about a quarter of an inch above the center of the port and snug the toothpick into the notches. Now, carefully turn the housing upside down, position the free toothpick so that it's loosely sitting in the notches, and roll up the fiber until it stretches enough to center the sensor in the port. Snug the bottom toothpick in place, and then secure both toothpicks with a bit of crazy glue. Your sensor is now installed. Next, clip off the excess bits of the toothpicks, and then carefully dremel the stubs flush to the housing. At this point, you have a compass. As you carefully rotate the housing, you'll see that the sensor stays well aligned with the Earth's magnetic field. Now, this sensor is very sensitive to vibration. This can be a big problem in a home-based laboratory if you want to be able to get data when people are walking around elsewhere in your house or trucks are rumbling down a nearby road. Yes, this instrument really is that sensitive. Fortunately, the shimmying mode that you see here is easy to damp out using a Q-tip. Just trim off one end and paint the shaft with nail polish to prevent it from swelling and changing with humidity. Next, position the shaft in the bottom lip of the front port as shown so that when you bang on the table, the shimmying motion is quickly damped out. 
Then secure it in place using plenty of crazy glue and trim off the excess length. The instrument is going to need a stable base. So at this point I added a ceramic drink coaster so that I could see how it was all going to come together. I'll attach it a little later in the build. Next, you'll need to seal the openings to protect the sensor from any tiny air movements in the room. And a simple way to do that is to stretch a bit of plastic sandwich wrap over each opening and secure it with a rubber band or hair tie. Trim off the excess and make the surface taut by judiciously tugging around the edges to remove any wrinkles. This approach creates a clear window that doesn't distort the laser beam very much and provides easy access to the interior in case you ever need to adjust the sensor. Note that the sensor is so close to the front window that the slide cover can't rotate all the way around. Since we're only tracking small shifts in the magnetic field, this isn't a problem. Just make sure when you cover this port that the cover slip is positioned with its painted side facing the window. Note also that since I had to cut the front window port so short, I couldn't get a hair tie to stay. So I had to tie it in place using a bit of nylon cord that wraps around the back. Finally, attach the instrument to the base with a little silicon caulking. Your torsion magnetometer is now complete. At most places on Earth, the magnetic field is about half a gauss or 50 microteslas. However, the magnetic field of the solar wind is much weaker, only about a billionth of a tesla or so. That means that the signals that we want to capture are only faint wiggles on top of a comparatively huge pedestal that's 10,000 times greater. That's like trying to track the crown of the Pillbury Doughboy's hat while he's dancing on top of the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building on Earth. To observe the signal, you're going to need to zero out the pedestal by adding a nulling magnetic field that exactly cancels the field of the Earth. And, believe it or not, that's actually really easy to do. To create the nulling field, you're going to need some rare earth disk magnets like these that are all aligned in the same direction. These happen to be one half inch in diameter, and that's a pretty good size to use. Basically, you want to lay these out in a big grid so that all of their magnetic fields are pointing in the same direction to create a fairly uniform magnetic field in front of the grid. I found these at my local Michaels Art Supply Store, and they just happen to be perfectly packaged for this application. All you have to do is stack them and tape them together like this. If you can't find magnets pre-packaged like this, your job's not that much harder. Just crazy glue between 12 and 16 one half inch rare earth magnets in a rectangular grid. Make sure you use a stiff support and make sure that their magnetic poles are all aligned. That is, all the north poles are facing one way and all the south poles are facing the other. Next, measure the height of your magnets on your sensor from the bottom of the table. Then, Tape your nulling magnets to a convenient stand that you can easily move around the table so that the center of the nulling magnets is at the exact same height as the magnets on your sensor. I use an old milk bottle, but almost anything that's not magnetic will do. Now, pick a place to set up your instrument. You'll want to mount the scale about 2 meters or 6 feet away from the sensor. And you want to mount the sensor so that it's facing either magnetic east, that is 90 degrees clockwise from magnetic north, or magnetic west, which is, of course, 90 degrees counterclockwise from magnetic north. Now it's time to null your instrument. First, remove anything that you're wearing that might be ferromagnetic so that the sensor's magnets won't track you as you move around. Then, position the center of the nulling magnets as precisely as possible along the magnetic north-south line that passes through the center of your magnetometer, and slowly move the nulling magnets towards it. As you do this, one of two things will happen. Either the sensor will remain pointed at the nulling magnets, or it will flip 180 degrees at some point. If it doesn't flip, then the nulling magnet is reinforcing the local field. In that case, return the nulling magnet to its starting position and turn it around so that the opposite side is facing the sensor. Then slowly move it towards the sensor again. When the nulling magnet nearly cancels the Earth's field, 
you'll see the sensor's response dramatically relax. Its period of rotation about its axis will slow, and even the tiniest shifts in position of the nulling magnet will cause large deflections. When you reach this point, your sensor is effectively nulled. Very carefully nudge the nulling magnet until the sensor is swinging freely and is aligned roughly along the east-west line. Now, if your sensor simply flips from one side to the other without ever reaching this lazy response state, then the nulling magnets are off the magnetic north-south line. Nudge the nulling magnet slightly along the east-west line until you find the sweet spot. If that doesn't work, start the process again, taking special care to keep the center of the nulling magnet along the sensor's north-south line. Now it's time to add the laser. You're going to need to keep the laser on for hours or even days at a time, and the cheapest way I know to do that is to buy a laser pointer with a rechargeable battery that can be powered from a USB port. I'll put a link to the one I use below. I secure mine to a ring stand and position the laser so that it's just a little below the reflector and directed slightly upward so the beam passes above the laser onto the scale. Finally, we're going to add a zero adjust. To do that, affix a rare earth magnet to a convenient cylindrical stand. I use a small flashlight and set it about 60 centimeters or two feet away from the sensor. Here's the setup. I'm right next to the nulling magnets. Here's the magnetometer, the laser, and there's the zero adjust and the screen. Right now, the laser spot is well off center. But if I rotate the zero adjust just a bit, you get a big deflection. So first, get the oscillation centered on the zero point and then wait for them to die down. After that, it takes just the slightest tweak to get your magnetometer exactly zeroed. Here's an overview of the whole setup so you can clearly see where everything is positioned. And now, it's time to take some data. Here's a time-lapse video I made showing nine and a half hours of continuous running. And as you can see, the local magnetic field is clearly fluctuating and drifting as the Earth rotates and the magnetic field inside my kitchen changes in time. Now, there are other effects, such as electric currents in the ionosphere, that your magnetometer can also detect, but I'm going to cut this video off here. If you'd like to learn how to calibrate your instrument, how to digitize the signal, and how to compare your data to NASA's, let me know in the comments below. If there's enough interest out there, I'll make a follow-up video that will show you how to upgrade your magnetometer to allow you to do publication-worthy research. If you like this project, please smash the like and subscribe buttons. And if you'd like to see more content like this, please help this channel grow by sharing this video with your friends and colleagues. For the Citizen Scientist Workshop, I'm Sean Carlson. Happy sciencing, everybody, and I'll see you in the next one.